Welcome to Spa Talk, where we will increase your certainty by exploring the science, the philosophy, and the art of our chiropractic profession. I'm Dr. Michelle Krennic, and our special guest today is Dr. Rob Vasquez. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rob. Thanks for having me. So how about start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? A little bit about myself. Well, uh, where do we start? <laughs> now, so a little bit about myself, even uh, chiropractically speaking, just how it is that I got into chiropractic because I don't have, I didn't really have a strong chiropractic background growing up. Um, I really knew that I wanted to be able to help people. Um, I always gravitated towards health, didn't really know how I was going to do that. And so um, growing up, uh, anytime that we had any kind of health issues, we were always going to the doctor for different things. And in fact, I still know. <laughs> My pediatrician's name, Dr. David Jamison. That's how often that we were going there. And I think I like to go there just because we got to be able to pick a toy out of this little bucket that he had after you left. But uh, in the room, the main reason my mom used to take me there was because I had headaches. And so I always suffered these headaches. And then as, as time went on, those headaches became worse. And then when I was in college, I had started having migraine headaches. And, and I just did what everybody else does. And you take a lot of medication for those things. And and that's really what the solution had always become. And so I said, hey, you know what? I really want to figure this out for myself so that I don't have to worry about these things anymore. And I had I had looked at going to physical therapy school. And, and I'm one of those people, if, if there's something that I want to do, I want to go find somebody who's already doing it so that I can be able to follow them and I don't have to make the same mistakes that they mm -hmm. did. So I went, I was at Texas Tech University and I went and volunteered time at the physical therapy school there and I decided uh, that's not what I wanted to do and the reason being is because when people were getting their PT there they were like miserable like they didn't <laughs> want to be there so they were having to like make people do all these different exercises and I'm like okay I don't want to do that and so next thing so uh, next thing I was like okay maybe going to medical school would be the thing so I um, enrolled and uh, they had a waiting list to be able to get in um, but I'm so that was in Lubbock, uh, Texas Tech. And then I'm from San Antonio. So we called the Health Science Center in San Antonio and they didn't have a wait list. They said, come on down. So I went down there and I still had to fin finish up some prerequisites before going into school. And one of my lab partners in a chemistry class in San Antonio was like, man, why are you going to medical school? Why don't you just go to chiropractic school? And I'm like, <laughs> what? It was like completely foreign to me. I'm like, why would I do that? And so. Meanwhile, I was still I was actually taking classes there at the University of, of, of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. And I would ask some of my professors about chiropractic and they kind of just was like, ah, chiropractic. Uh, why would you even think about going to that? So I kind of just dismissed it. And so I ended up starting medical school and the migraine headaches were worse than ever before. And so still trying to figure out what to do for them. I started asking my professors, what do I do? They said, well, try this test or try this test, try this test. And, and I tried every test that you could ever imagine. The solution was always exactly the same. Take more drugs, take more medication. I was still having these migraine headaches to the degree that now, because of all the oral medication that I was taking, was eating a hole through my stomach. Wow. I'm not good. So I was having these <laughs> ulcers, spitting up blood, never a good thing. And so I went in again and said, hey, that's not going to work for me. So they said, try this. They gave me injectable Imitrix. So then anytime I felt a migraine headache coming on, I would just oh. literally stab myself in the leg with this Imitrix. And, uh, and I'm like, I can't live my life like that. So there's got to be another solution. So I went back in. They said, well, we can do this experimental procedure on you where we'll drill a hole in oh. the back of your head to be able to relieve pressure. Um, and so two things I don't ever like um, in a sentence. Number one is experimental. <laughs> Number two is drill. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm out on that. And then... In the back of my head, I heard this, this Jimmy was, was my lab partner's name, Jimmy's voice in the back of my head saying, you should try chiropractic. And so what's funny is that my dad, my stepmother, and both of my sisters had been seeing a chiropractor and I used to make fun of them for going to the chiropractor. And, uh, and my stepmother's sister was the chiropractic assistant <laughs> at the office that they were going to. So I had the phone number, I called them up and said, hey, I wanna come in. I need to get some help from these migraine headaches. And, and I don't know if I was going in there to kind of prove what it is that he was doing was, was wrong because mm -hmm. I had kind of an ego at the time being in medical school. And I went in there and he started talking to me. And when he was talking to me about the physiology and the anatomy of how the body works in the nervous system, it, act, it made sense. And so I'm like, all right, it can't be that simple, can it? <laughs> and so he started working on me. And next thing I knew, my migraine headaches were completely gone. 
And so I'm like, this is really cool. What in the world am I doing over here in medical school? So I literally, that was in, that was at the end of my first year in May. I packed up my bags. I hadn't even gotten into Parker yet. I sent off my application. I ended up getting in, started the following spring and then never looked back. And so that's, that's how it is that I ended up becoming a chiropractor because it wasn't like, I dreamt of being a chiropractor growing up. Right. It literally saved my life. And the cool thing is now I get to be able to help people just like I was helped. Wow, that's so, awesome. That yeah. That's probably what's built your passion because we can tell how passionate you are about this. And so you mentioned going to Parker. What year did you graduate? So I graduated in January of 97. And then because of uh, credentialing and those kinds of things, mm -hmm. I ended up getting my license and started March the 19th of 1998. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so besides that very unique story, is there anything else that's kind of unique that, that about your story? I guess even if it's when you were in practice, but about your chiropractic story that might help some of our listeners? I think the uniqueness of my chiropractic story is that um, it's it's so, I think we try to to make things a lot more complicated than it is. And I think even for myself, I was looking for all of these answers outside mm -hmm. of even myself. And the great thing is that we've been given this this body um, that really is our cheat sheet as to way every the way everything works. And we've already got this, you know, we talk about this innate intelligence and this inborn wisdom inside of us that knows what to do all the time. And so as chiropractors, all we have to really do is make sure that we're supporting that inborn wisdom in order to be able to do its job. And it really is just as simple as that. I, uh, when I was at Parker, I used to I used to work at the Four Seasons and I was mm -hmm. I was a server there. And one of the patrons that I got to be able to to, to wait on while I was there was Dr. Parker. Mm -hmm. And so, and Aww. because, and it was funny because nobody nobody wanted to wait on him. And mm -hmm. the reason nobody wanted to wait on him is because back then you could actually smoke indoors. <laughs> and so, if you know anything about Dr. Parker, you know he loved his cigars. And so we'd have wait staff. And I remember the first time that I even saw he was there, it, there's one of the waiters came back in the back. They're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> That guy that's always smoking the cigars with the cigar smoke around him. I'm going to go home smelling like cigar smoke. Will you go wait on him? And I'm like, I don't want to go wait on somebody that's smoking cigars out there. And I looked and I'm like, oh, yep, I'll take that table. That's Dr. Jim Parker. So now I've got a captive, um, you know, I've, I've got him right there. I can ask him any question that I that I want. Mm -hmm. And so I was I, th I thank God for that opportunity because he passed away a short time after that. And right. so I got to listen to him help me to make sense of the things that he would talk about at the Parker seminars that I had no idea what right. he was talking about at, the, at that point, because I didn't come from that kind of a background. Right. So is there anything you did ask him while, while he, you're waiting on him? Or You know, I would ask him things and he, he would always say things. You know what? He goes, Rob, it always goes back to, to one thing. It always goes back to love. Mm -hmm. You know, if you love what you do, that's where your certainty will come from. You can't get there. There's no firmer foundation than just making sure that you're always coming from a p place of of loving, servanthood. And that's, that's what always rang true with me. So when I started practice, I just always remember going into practice going, you know what, I'm doing this to love and to serve. And he used to always say everything else is going to be a side effect of that. So the success, the money, the, just all of those different things. If you just go in there with the attitude of loving and serving, everything else will come. And uh, I remember even when I started practice, I'd hired this management group or that management group, and they would teach me like, you know, you're going to do this in order to be able to have this kind of a lifestyle. And it never mm. really resonated with me because it wasn't putting loving service right. first. And mm -hmm. that's how I really did everything. If not for me, it was completely incongruent. Right. That's a blessing. We'd all like to be waiting on Dr. Parker, right? <laughs> <laughs> so March 1998, March 19th, 1998. Mm -hmm. Tell us that story. What did you do right after graduation? Did you open your own? Did you start with someone? So like I said, I'm, I'm that person that if I see somebody that's doing something remotely like what it mm -hmm. is that I want to do, I'm going to go learn from them. So we had a chiropractor that came and spoke at Parker, and she was the chiropractor back then for the Dallas Stars. And I was really into sports chiropractic. I didn't I, I didn't really have like this, like this principled philosophical type of a background, because like I was mm -hmm. saying, when I would listen to Dr. Parker before waiting on him, which was at the end of uh, at the end of me being a Parker, everything would go over my head. <laughs> And, and, and I'm ashamed to say at this point, even in our philosophy classes, I'm like, I still didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not my background. And so getting so. So what, what was the question? again? I get so, so passionate about that. 
<laughs> it was what did you do uh, after oh, okay, March yeah. 19th, 1998. <laughs> so I went and found this this doc that was speaking and that spoke at an assembly. And I said, hey, she's doing what I want to be doing, working with mm -hmm. athletes. So she really took me under my wing. And I thought it was interesting because all of these people were like, that's amazing. All those things that she's, she's doing. Everybody in my class was talking about it. And she said, anybody can show up to my office. Um, come and ask me any questions that you want. You can come hang out. And I went and it was interesting because she said, you're the only person that actually showed up. Mm -hmm. And I would, I, I go, tell me anything that you want me to do. Uh, I was taking out the trash. I was filing things. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. I just want to learn from you. And I remember back then it was like Mike Badano, who is uh, one of the, one of the Dallas stars, most mm -hmm. famous Dallas star probably. And like Troy Aikman would come walking through or Michael Irvin would come walking through mm -hmm. and just talking to <laughs> talk, talk to me like I was a normal person. And then I would just be in the room watching her treat these people. And that was such a great experience for me because I'm like, hey, these are regular people that all we're really doing is we're looking for the interference. We're removing the interference so that their bodies can be able to perform at their best. And through that, I was able to travel around the country with the men's professional volleyball tour, wow. the women's professional volleyball tour. And that just gave me a certainty that I would have never had without that. So when I opened my practice, I thought that was just like a normal thing. So I had the faith, confidence, and belief to start calling um, schools and letting them know, hey, I'd already been working with professional athletes. And they were like, yeah, come on in. So then I would, next thing you know, I was the chiropractor for the, for the high school football team, the gymnastics team, those, you know, all those, those different things, because mm -hmm. that's what it is that I was learning while I was in school. So I already had that under my belt. And they thought from a credibility st standpoint, if he's already worked with these people, why wouldn't I want this guy to come in mm -hmm. and work with our athletes? I mean, they didn't know at the time that I had no idea anything about gymnastics, for example, right. <laughs> but uh, I, I do now. And so that's, that's what it is that I did to start. And so, and, and I thought I was gonna be working for her because she said, hey, I'm gonna have an associate position. And so mm -hmm. when I graduate, so everything was moving towards that. And then I graduate, and she's like, I'm sorry, but I don't have an associate position available. Mm -hmm. So then I'm like, crud, what am I gonna do now? <laughs> so like, I gotta figure out something. So I went to 27 different banks to be able to pitch you know, my story on, on starting up. And I got told no 27 times because <laughs> I had this student loan debt mm -hmm. and I didn't have a rich uncle or rich parents to, to be able to give me any money. And so I was like, what am I gonna do? And she said, hey, I didn't have that associate position, but there's a doctor in Bedford, Texas, who's got a room for lease, if you wanna go rent that room. And so I said, yeah, sure, I'll go check it out. I didn't know anything about Bedford, Texas. And so I go in and I talk to him, he's like, hey, here's the room. And it was like this like eight by eight room, <laughs> right? You can barely even fit a chiropractic table mm -hmm. in there. And I said, I'll take it, a great opportunity. And that's, that's what I did to start. So I was an independent contractor in there and I just paid him a percentage mm -hmm. of whatever it is that I collected. And uh, it was it was fun, and I, I remember that. And there's there's days when when things get like really complicated for me, or I've got a ton of stuff on my plate. I will still literally just go pull into that parking lot so mm -hmm. I can be able to remember the simplicity of things back then. That it's not about the stuff. It's not about all, all the things that we want. It really is about that 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 loving servanthood. And I'll just go sit in that parking lot and remember that. Now it's a T-Mobile. <laughs> So I think I think about loving, <laughs> serving, and cell phones. <laughs> There's so much good stuff you just said. I want to ask so many questions, but it is good also because one of the the goals of this uh, podcast is to show students that they don't have to go out and spend you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to open up a practice. That it is okay to start like that. I had a practice um, my first year it was really big. My second it was like an eight by eight room in San Antonio, renting space from a massage therapist, and then I grew and grew and grew as I as my practice got bigger. But on that note though, before I forget, I wanted to ask you about, um, you're involved with Parker Students. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that, the program? Yeah, so I'm in the CBI program, right. which is the community-based internship, mm -hmm. which which I love because I get so, so I'm called an adjunct professor for mm -hmm. Parker because students can be able to come into the practice. They can work with patients. They can be able to do real world things. And, uh, and then they get to be able to get hours to be able to use towards graduation. So um, the two that I have in there right now, I absolutely love uh, this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of mad at you for bringing it up because <laughs> this Wednesday is their last day in the office. And so we're absolutely going to miss them. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that they've said throughout their, their, their time in the office has been just that 
um, how great of an experience it's been because they've been able to get to learn you know, how to do things at the front desk. They've been able to learn the patient systems as far as just bringing a new mm -hmm. patient through the whole process, through report of findings, getting them started, and then taking care of them, as well as some of the marketing things that we do. And so they've really right. both had a great experience, which I'm you know, super excited for them now, now to be able to go into practice. This is why I brought it up, so you can get a couple more really good <laughs> Parker students. No, I think it's so important. I tell students all the time, you have to go see different offices and, and to see how you want to practice, too, help you throughout school. So um, I'm going to recommend students come see you. Thank you. So um, all of that, is there anything that you would do different um, from when you started? or? You know, that's a great question because I'm the kind of person that I like to be in charge of and in control <laughs> of things. So I don't think I would do anything different, to be honest with mm -hmm. you, because I think that all of those experiences helped me. It helped really prepare me for people saying no to me like being turned down by the bank all of those different times. Mm -hmm. Because I think if a bank would have just said, yes, absolutely, here's, you know, $80,000 or, you know, and, and by the way, even when I did start, finally, when I, when I left that office that I was renting space from, even when I went into practice, I think my loan that I got was only $40,000. And even at the $40,000, I never used it. Mm -hmm. And so, which was really cool wow. because it never matured. So I could just go, go hey, here's your $40,000 back, which was super nice because I never had a loan payment. But um yeah, I don't think there, there's anything that I would do differently because I don't know that I would have been the best associate doctor, honestly, mm -hmm. because I just like to do things the way I like to do things. Right. <laughs> and you had built your certainty by going to the chiropractor's office and seeing and traveling and all of that. So that helped you start your own, right? Absolutely. Uh, so is there anything you're doing now that you wish you would have been doing years ago? Or I guess I could go the opposite. Are you doing anything now that you weren't doing years ago? Yes, to the <laughs> second part of that. So I've always, and people always ask me, well, what did you do to build your practice, right? Mm -hmm. So the one thing that I did to build my practice was really create relationships with people in our community. So I, if there was, if there was a group of people that was meeting, I was there. It didn't matter where it was or even how far it was from, mm -hmm. from the practice. One of my, my biggest mentors in chiropractic has been Dr. Patrick Gentempo. And I can remember him saying, hey, you know what, just go speak to as many people as, as you possibly can. Um, go meet as many people as you possibly can. And I really literally took that literally. And I remember there was there was a screening that was being held, this Hispanic health fair in Dallas that was, it was like an hour away from the practice. And I can remember going there going, hey, you know what? There's going to be a lot of people here. We're going to talk to a lot of people. And me, yes, my last name is Vasquez, but I don't actually speak <laughs> Spanish. So I just say I'm just brown on the outside, white on the inside. My friends lovingly call me a coconut. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I would I went to this screening and the cool thing is just communicating health with people. If you're coming from a place of love and serving, I didn't need to know um, the language. We had a line of people there for hours and hours and hours. The organizers of that event made us go take a lunch because so many people were mm -hmm. waiting to see us. And we had all these people traveling an hour away just to be able to come into the office to be able to get chiropractic care, which was super duper cool. And so... I mean, I would say it's just just really creating those relationships is what it is that helped to be able to build that practice early mm -hmm. on and just um, finding a group of people. So to answer your question now, the great thing is because of things like what it is that we're doing right now on a po podcast to where we can be able to be on video, we can be able to communicate right here in this room, but we can we can communicate to thousands of people now our message. And so just utilizing social media to create the relationships in the community has been really a big thing that we've been able to do now because mm -hmm. the workshops that I would do in the office, for example, if we were doing a spinal um, care workshop, I can now do that spinal care workshop through a Facebook Live that goes to our patients where our patients are the only ones in that group to be able to teach them. But I can also then share that with people in the community and I can target everybody that's in our demographic for our office. Right. So our office being predominantly a wellness office where we you know, typically it's mom that comes in first and then the kids and then mm -hmm. dad finally makes it in. Right. When it's when his pain is bad enough. Mm -hmm. But we can now target that exact demographic through using social media. And I think one of the one of the things with social media right now is that and it's always been this chiropractically speaking. Um, you may agree with me when you know it seems like chiropractors are always looking for the magic bullet <laughs> to try to be able to get new patients mm -hmm. into the door. I haven't found that magic bullet. Right. Um, yeah, OK, <laughs> just just make it because if you did, let me know. But, yeah, right. 
but Talk about that in a it, it, the magic bullet really is 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 work and just mm -hmm. just being diligent about getting the getting the message out there and i think a lot of people now think that like social media is the magic bullet if right. I pay somebody enough money, I'll get enough leads coming in. And what we find with those leads is they're typically, um, you got to chase mm -hmm. people around all over the place, it creates more work, more stress, not fun. But if we can be able to utilize it to create relationships with the target demographic, the next thing you know, they're calling the office whenever it is that they have an issue going on. And that's one of the things that I really love now because I don't necessarily have to travel to all of these different groups in the community because I can speak to them from the comfort of my my own home or from the office. Right. And I guess my magic bullet, if anything, would be, but you have to get them in first, and then it's the education and communication oh. so they understand. But you have to get them there first. But Absolutely. You do have a weekly, um, you go face, on, on Facebook Live once a week, right? I, so people can follow you. If not more. <laughs> if not more. Okay, so at least a couple <laughs> times. So I would encourage students, doctors, to go on and follow you. I mean, just to your information yeah absolutely so mm -hmm. if, I, if i'm learning something and reading something then i'll present it back in a way that's going to be apl applicable so mm -hmm. people can actually make it beneficial for them as well in the real world right besides all the good advice you've already given us what would you what advice would you give to students and then follow that up with what advice would you give to doctors yeah it's a, it's a great question what here's what i would say is because of platforms like facebook and instagram and those kind of things i would start finding your voice now as a student, um, get on mm -hmm. and, and make it make it a habit that once a week that you would get on and just start talking about what it is that you're passionate about. And so as if you'd be talking to your mother about, hey, here's some of the things that you can do in order to be able to be healthy and start giving value to people and just do it consistently. And that's going to be the key when it comes to anything social media related, because it's kind of like it's kind of like television, right? People are tuning in. You tune in every Monday night to watch the next episode of American Idol or whatever it is that you're watching. So it's kind of like, you know, if you'll just do it consistently at the same time every single week. And, and here's what I'll say is that you can write down like a list of your favorite topics and just pick those topics and start talking about those things. And if you do it long enough, you're going to run out of topics. And that's when things get really good because then you start talking about what you really love. And it goes back to what Dr. Parker said, right? It goes back to the foundation being love. And now you're really speaking from your heart. And that's what people connect to. Awesome. So that goes to students and doctors, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And you kind of discussed this already, but the most effective way that you found to get patients to come in or new patients, would that be? You know what? It's, it's going to be what, it's communicating, right? Mm -hmm. Educating. Just like mm -hmm. you said, once somebody comes in, educating them on, on why it is that they're here. I always say, um, I don't want their spines. I want their minds. Because if they know why it is that they're showing up, they'll always show up and they know why to refer, refer their friends into the office as well. So education being the key and then see what kind of platforms that you can use to do that. So one could be social media. Another one for us is lunch and learns in the community. We've got a lunch and learn uh, this Wednesday where we'll be doing a lunch and learn to all of the valets that valet park cars at the airport. And so they need help, too. So we'll go do a talk <laughs> for them. We've got another one next week. So. Those are two of the avenues that I use. I do a dinner with the doc program that I do once a month, every month. We do our spinal um, health care workshops for our patients. We do that twice a month, every month. So, yeah, it goes back to educating people. Right. And I, I guess the people that are involved in the CBI program really get to be involved with those things, too. Right. And see how you do it. That's awesome. They do. Absolutely. So wow. they know everything from A to Z on wow. how to be able to, for example, how to be able to set up a dinner with a doc, where to get the people from to actually show up and how to make sure the people who have registered actually show up to the dinner right. with the doc and then end up coming into the office to be able to um, get care. I have a feeling you're going to be overloaded with people wanting to come in now. <laughs> uh, so I've often heard through podcasts and just things in general that successful people have daily routines. Do you mm -hmm. have a daily routine? I do. Okay. I do. That's what I tell people is I, I would be the easiest person to try to track down because <laughs> I'm such a routine person. Like Everybody knows that knows me. They're like, okay, every Thursday night, Dr. Rob is out with his wife on date night. Mm -hmm. Every Monday, this is what he's doing every Tuesday. So yes, I've got a routine. So whenever it is that I get up in the morning, it, kind of, it, it actually starts before I go to bed at night. So before I go to the bed at night, I've got three affirmations that I'll go through based on where it is, wherever it is that I'm right, I am right now as far as right. my goals go. So I'll see those, but then what I'll do is I'll visualize those things as if it's happening right now. So I go through that visualization right before I go to bed. When I wake up first thing in the morning, I go through the same exact visualization. So I wake up around 4.30 in the morning. So I wake up, 
I'll go through my visualization. I do that for 30 minutes. After I do that, then I'll, I read my Bible. Um, I go into prayer. And then after I do that, I'll read something that's going to be more of a current event type of thing mm -hmm. that's health related. I'll read that. And then after I do that, I'll read a something that is teaching me more about marketing or getting a message out. Right. And so that's that's my morning routine every morning. That's awesome. Hey, well, we we're talking about books and things like that. So let's go to the next thing is what would you say is your favorite book? I'm sure you have multiple ones, but you can give it you can give us a couple also because I'm sure all will be helpful. But I say one book that I found to be really cool, especially when it comes to success habits, since you just asked that question. It's called Tools of the Titans by Tim Ferriss. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that book, it's, it's a big book, but it has habits that lots of different people do because I don't think that there's a one size fits all approach, right? And so, you know, some people could say, hey, Dr. Rob, that sounds really good, but they start doing what it is that I do. And they just find that, right. hey, you know what? I'm falling asleep by 11 o'clock in the morning <laughs> and I don't have any energy because I got up that early. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of different ways for you to be able to do that. And so that book shows you different things that, you know, the tools of the Titans, people that are successful, some of the things that they do. Right. I agree. I like that book also. What about a favorite quote? Favorite qu quote. Um, I like, I'm going to give you two. Okay. Okay. We like quotes. <laughs> One of them being um, expansion always in all ways. Always be growing. Always be growing because you're going to get resistance. And when that resistance comes, know that that right there is part of your growth process. The second one is going to be from Patrick Jim Temple. And I remember this from right when I graduated. And so what he said is contradictions lead to destruction, right? Mm -hmm. And the size of the contradiction leads to the size of the destruction. Mm -hmm. So if you're not a congruent or in alignment with your true purpose and you're doing things that are outside of your true purpose or your values, ultimately that ends up leading to destruction. Mm -hmm. and, and I've found that to be true the hard way a lot of times. <laughs> That's what Ayn Rand talks about, too, is mm -hmm. what he goes back to in yeah. Timbo. It's funny because yep. I was just listening to that this morning, which nice. you just said. <laughs> Meant to be today, <laughs> Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So, uh, and again, I'm sure there's multiple people that have influenced you, uh, who you are as a chiropractor and as a person. But who, who, are, who is someone, a uh, speaker or even a chiropractor that's influenced the person you are or the chiropractor you are that might help someone else? Just the same person that we were okay. just talking about is, is Patrick Jim Tempo mm -hmm. for sure. Because I remember that. I really didn't get chiropractic other than just being a treatment for musculoskeletal conditions. Even when I was mm -hmm. traveling around with the, with the AVP, the professional volleyball tours, we were treating people for a lot of musculoskeletal things, even nutritionally speaking. And we rarely ever worry when I was a student, I rarely, rarely ever saw anybody get adjusted. Right. And I just didn't know any different. And so it wasn't until uh, it was a student at Parker came to my office to visit, right? My first year in practice. And she's like, uh, have you ever heard of this, these tapes right here? It was this tape called the On Purpose Tapes that was mm -hmm. put out by Patrick Contempo and Christopher Kent. And I'm like, I that, that dates me, cassette tape, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, no, I've never heard of that before. And she gives me the tape. I put it in and uh, listen to it. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that right there is what they were talking about in those philosophy classes that I didn't know what they were talking about just a few short years mm -hmm. prior to that. And that's when it finally just licked. And then that's... That's the time then now mom started bringing their kids into the office and we were we were seeing people to really be able to correct vertebral subluxations. And as a result of that, seeing kids with autism getting better and the allergies mm -hmm. and the asthmas and all the things that I had heard about in chiropractic school, but really hadn't had that experience with people. That really is when when things clicked for me. It's like when you got it and it clicked, you attracted those people. Exactly. That, exactly. That chiropractic right. could really help. Right. Uh, so. What your great speaker? So I'm assuming that I don't know if you may have always been that way, but what would you what advice would you give to students uh, or even doctors about communicating uh, about chiropractic to people and building that certainty so they're able to do so? I'd say be simple. I know we learn a lot of big words mm -hmm. in chiropractic school, and we just want to like word vomit them all over people when we get out, and people have no idea what it is that we're talking about. I'd say the strongest thing that I've learned communicating with anybody when it comes to chiropractic especially, is first finding out the person in front of you, find out what they want. What is it that they're truly wanting? Like that person may want to get rid of their allergies or they may, may want to get out of neck pain or lower back pain, but if you can find out what it is that they want, then you can be able to communicate in a way that's going to help them get what it is that they want while then educating them on what chiropractic is all about. That's, oh. <laughs> okay, I have three more questions. 
We're just about done. You know, this is called spa. So science, philosophy, and art of chiropractic. I'm going to ask For you sure. a little bit about each one of those. Yep. Uh, if you're going to explain, uh, I, I would say help a chiropractor or a student explain to someone. So on that level, mm -hmm. uh, what is the, the science of chiropractic? Sure, the science of chiropractic, well, and again, like I said, I always go back to simple terms, right? right. Just this, the simplicity of a misalignment of a bone, putting stress to the nerves. Now, mm -hmm. don't, you know, don't right. kill me because a lot of people are like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's not the real true, that's not, you know, tr the true neurological mm -hmm. definition of, of chiropractic. But the reality is that it is just that simple because, you know, the bone moves out of alignment, it is going to stress out the nerves. And as a result of that stress, it's going to change the signals that the rest of your organs are going to be receiving and then vice versa going all the way back up. And the cool thing now is that from a scientific standpoint and something that really helped me to be able to increase my certainty is if you even look at a lot of the literature or the research, for example, like Adid Harrison puts out, he's got over 150 researched and published articles that are published in medical journals that back up scientifically everything that we've been saying and everything that we do. And there's something about just reading through those things that can really be able to help us with our certainty. And especially now, like, for example, if I go back in the office this afternoon and I'm adjusting somebody, and let's say, like, we do spinal correction in, in our office. So if I'm doing spinal correction, I can say, hey, you know what? When you have more of a curve inside, there's taking off the tension off the, off the, off the, the spinal cord right there. And as a result, your heart is going to work better I know that there's scientific journals that actually back up exactly what it is that I said. Mm -hmm. And I'll even tell the patient that that right there is completely backed up with science. Your body is working better. Your heart's working better today. Have a great day. And, uh, and it's cool because it's backed up, backed up by the science. Right. And that will increase the certainty so you can communicate it better. That's so important totally. for, for new doctors, for even for current doctors that can't quite um, get it out there, get, get the, the truth out there. But what about when someone says explain the philosophy of chiropractic? You know, when somebody says the, the philosophy of chiropractic, I think it goes back to what our belief is and what our intention is. And so I think that's a huge thing. For example, if somebody's laying, laying on my table, if my belief is that the body was designed to heal and to be well, and the body is designed with this innate wisdom that's always working at 100%, that I know that that, person's, that person that's laying on my table right now that all I have to do is simply help that body and support it so that it can be able to heal and be 100% because that innate wisdom is inside there at 100%. And if that's my belief and my intent is for that person to now function so they can be able to perform at a higher level, whether that means that they smile more today or they love more today or they hug more today or their allergies, you know, their allergy symptoms clear up or they feel better, whatever right. that is for that person's body, it's their body. That's not my deal. My intention is just to be able to help that person's body function better. So I think it comes back to belief in intention when it comes to the, the, the art of what it is that we are, the philosophy right. of what it is that we do is, is, is having that sound philosophy based on your beliefs. Right. And your belief can be backed up by the science. So it's really, totally. when you say philosophy, it's not a scary word because it's actually backed by science. That's why you believe it. And then the last one would be is, how would you explain the art of chiropractic absolutely so the art and i and i think the art really comes to back to what's your belief and what it is what it is that you're doing right because then that supports the art of what you do through the actual adjustment itself right and so for me the adjustment isn't adjust is not an adjustment unless i've also positively thought about that person healing as well as communicated with that person that their body is gonna heal as well as a result of what it is that we just got through doing. So that's part of my art and whenever I'm adjusting somebody as well as then, you know, where it is that I'm thrusting and how I'm doing that because, you know, I'm very specific with the way it is mm -hmm. that, I've, that I've done that. And I had my first chiropractor said, hey, you know, Rob, it's probably gonna be about 2000 adjustments before you actually feel comfortable with adjusting somebody. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no way. That's a lot of adjustments. And then I can remember I, I was like counting and then I get get to like 2000. I'm like, I still don't feel completely comfortable. Oh, my gosh. He was actually underestimated the number. But, you know, once you know and you get there, but you just got to put your hands on a lot of people, which meant that I had to go out in the community and speak to a lot of people. So as far as the art goes, it's really not just one thing for me. It's not just the technique. And I think even when I was in school, it was all about 
what's the technique? You know, are you gonna mm-hmm. are you doing Gonstead? Are you doing AK? Are you doing Diversified? Are you doing Thompson? What? And, and it was like going to all these different technique seminars. But I think really the technique is already inside you. Right. You have to just let that come out. That's, that's very well put. That's what I tell students is you really have to go out there and experience it. And that's going to help build your philosophy, science, and art, which is going to help build your certainty. And so you said it just like I would have said it. Uh, so I want to thank you so much for being here. You're awesome. I know we're going to do a lot with you in the future. And I thank you for all you do for Parker and for the new, the new chiropractors that are coming out. Sad you're losing a couple, but you're going to gain a couple, oh, ab- absolutely. About, We're a couple excited. hundred more probably after this. Uh, so I do want people to be able to contact you, though. So whatever you're comfortable with, you can give me your uh, contact information. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a couple ways. You can go to robvasquez.com. Okay. Pretty easy. V-A-S-Q-U-E-Z. Okay. Or you can be able to go to Rob Vasquez on Facebook. And then you can also go to the other channel that we have. It's called The Happy Healthy Guys on Facebook. And that's where we do a lot of our health information comes comes from that as far as to the general public. So if you want to learn how to be able to speak to the general public about health-related things, right. that's going to be the Happy Healthy Guys. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Rob. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been awesome. It has. We want to be your source, source for building your faith, your confidence, and your belief so you aren't afraid to share the truth. You have the power and the ability to change lives. I'm going to leave you with a little quote Uh, Actually, a big quote by B.J. Palmer Uh, is very powerful. You never know how far reaching something you think, say, or do today will affect the lives of millions tomorrow. I'm Dr. Michelle Krennic. Thank you for joining us for Spot Talk.